Welcome to Blunt Business. Thanks for being on with us. This week we have a guest that is a returning guest from about 18 months ago that we had him on. And he runs the first licensed commercial lender in the United States, focused on the legal cannabis industry, offering short-term lending options to fuel business growth. I want to welcome back the CEO and co-founder of Bespoke Financial, George Mantrell. George, thanks for being back on. Thanks for having me. So you recently announced an integrated partnership with Blaze Solutions, a leading cannabis technology company, and this establishes an, an embedded lending product providing cannabis retailers access to your company's financing at the click of a button with the your, with their dispensary POS software. So I just want to learn, first of all, how the partnership came about and what is it among all the other point of sale softwares that are in the market, many of them, what is that this partnership was the right fit? Yeah, no, I mean, you know, obviously for us, we're focused here on, you know, finding different ways to address this capital need within the industry. For anyone that's followed cannabis, you know, fundraising is a challenge just because of the regulatory ambiguity that exists on the federal level. So for us, you know, given we've had a three and a half year track record of, you know, being the active deployer of capital within the space to plan touching companies, um, you know, the idea was let's find other strong partners that are focused on on the same mission objective. And, you know, the team at Blaze, you know, have been fantastic to work with, you know, similar to Bespoke, we're both aligned in terms of trying to solve as many problems for operators directly. And especially for dispensaries, you know, these are these are companies that for the most part are mom and pop. Um, you know, they've been bootstrapped just in terms of having their own capital invested in the business and growing as the business matures. And so, you know, the automated, streamlined, easy funding process seemed like it would be most impactful for that part of the market. And so, you know, it was a real alignment of the stars. Um, and we think, look, you know, especially for cannabis operators in mature markets, things are much more competitive. Things are, you know, from a macro standpoint, increasingly challenging. And we look at our financing as a very valuable tool and resource that these operators have in their back pocket so that, you know, they can unlock additional value from economies of scale, they can improve their relationships with vendors, and ultimately have a competitive advantage um, relative to anyone in the space that's still working just with their own bootstrapped friends and family personal investment capital. Among all the platforms that are out there for enterprise resource planning or ERP. We know there are, there's a lot of choices out there in the market. We know that a lot of states have their own particular recommendations, whichever cannabis program there is, medical or adult use, where you know there's only certain ones that are allowed in certain markets, it feels like too. What is it about this partnership where you feel like, I mean, is the access to as many companies as possible, MSOs, to be able to go ahead and access your services along with Blaze? You know, is there any limitations right now on the, what you have? And, you know, where does Blaze stand out in the market among some of the other ones that, you know, some states might not uh, have placed as part of the compliance platform or the compliance <laughs> idea? Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, from, from the state regulator side, you know, typically, um, you know, the state will designate one seed to sale compliance platform that all operators have to record all their transactional activity. Uh, the POS platforms, um, they are the central tool for these dispensaries to really run their business, right? So between managing inventory, recording sales, um, you know, submitting POs for their vendors for restocking, uh, it's a very vital tool that then records information onto the state designated seed to sale compliance platform. Uh, for us, we think this partnership with Blaze is, is a huge competitive advantage. Um, we think it strengthens the overall offering for Blaze. It leverages our expertise on bespoke side as just, you know, experienced deployers of capital into the space. So again, it just, it was leveraging the strengths of both partners together at once. And we think it provides a meaningful added on value add service for any operator that's, that's working in the space because again, access to capital has been a huge limiting factor for, for this industry from day one. And so, you know, the streamlined access, yes. And whether it's an MSO, whether it's an independent location, um, you know, brick and mortar or delivery, we 
have a, a wide variety of clients that we work with right now. Um, and our financing is really just meant to be there for all parts of the market, not just any subset. <clears throat> and just to make clear, because everybody knows very much familiar with metric being most trusted experienced provider of regulatory systems, that the fact that blaze does work, uh, integrates for various markets, for Alaska, California, Colorado, Maryland, Michigan, Montana, Nevada, Oregon, and Washington, D.C., I'm sure there are others. So overall, it is great that you have this component of compliance. We talk about this extensively on the program. And then one of the other things now that you also have that goes along with this partnership with Blaze is you're looking to expand a buy now, pay later service. That's really what caught my attention for us to bring you back. Uh, you've launched that service now or expanding right now in California and Massachusetts. You told this to Reuters uh, last month about this. And this is after mm -hmm. a successful pilot launch in July, allowing cannabis retail outlets to buy products from producers using the service that allows them to pay back after its sale. And this That's uses right. Blaze coming out of the weed sector to struggling to get funds from banks as it's classified as illegal under federal rules. So, I mean, obviously, if we, you know, if companies were able to go and get some financial services where they can, you know, either get loans or get some kind of financial backing, something that goes off the collateral of the company. Until then, we need this buy now, pay later scheme, correct? Yeah. And quite honestly, I would say even even after federal regulation changes, you know, B2B buy now, pay later inventory, financing, all of these services are, you know, they fall under this umbrella of supply chain financing. And that's something that any industry, you know, both cannabis and outside cannabis is very reliant upon because, you know, manufacturers and producers want to sell products. Buyers don't want to float. They don't want to tie up their capital and in inventory that just sits on their shelves. Right. for, you know, however period of time it takes for them to actually sell it to their own client base. And so, you know, we've always looked at our secured financing as unlocking value on the balance sheets of these operators. So, you know, you have inventory, you have a cannabis license, you have a going concern, that's capital and that's value that just sits on your balance sheet for the most part. And by working with Bespoke or by using our buy now, pay later services with, uh, you know, the Blaze partnership, what you're doing is accessing capital and leveraging the strength of your own assets that you have in your balance sheet. And I think that continues even after federal regulation changes, because again, every single industry is trying to find that right balance. For a producer, it's easier to sell if you tell your customer to pay you, you know, at a much later date, but that puts you in a capital crunch. You're sacrificing that cash flow and that revenue, and especially in this market, cash is king. On the flip side, for you know the dispensaries and the buyers, they want to carry inventory and then pay for it as it sells, just to similarly not be bottlenecked by that same capital constraint. And so for us, we look at this as providing liquidity into a space and again, facilitating more transactions and ultimately strengthening that relationship. Because anyone who's followed the California market, um, the Oregon market, the Colorado market, this whole idea of collections and you know making sure that your dispensary customers are paying you on time that's a full-time job function for a lot of these manufacturers. And the bigger you grow, the more important it is for you to have infrastructure and processes in place to stay on top of collections. With a service like this, we're looking to alleviate a lot of that redundancy and workflow, even though you know some of it will still exist in some form or capacity. But ultimately, what we're trying to do is really just free up the capital needs, free up the operational, you know, headaches of tracking payments and what's left owed, and really just allow these operators to focus on, you know, their core mission, which is executing on in terms of their business. Now, with this, the space, obviously, when we have the, the when we have companies that want to buy products, as, as it says here, that retail outlets want, are going to be able to buy products for producers using the service, allowing them to pay back that's normal procedure, I'll imagine, in the, in the mainstream retail sector. Was there any kind of hesitation? Maybe not. In the pilot program, you're showing that it worked out well with the companies that were working together on this program. But are there those in the cannabis industry that might not have any mainstream experience that they might encounter this here? And they're saying, no, we want to be paid up front. Um, I, I, I think the the people that would be paid up front would be the 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 manufacturers the the suppliers the the brands that are selling into these dispensaries and so you know we've honestly had very positive 
uh, traction and response from both sides of the equation. You know, mm-hmm. dispensaries obviously love the flexibility and the access to capital. And for a brand, this really is just a way for them to get paid up front. You know, again, it's like reducing that burden of, you know, we sell on net 30 terms and then 45 days after they receive the product, we're chasing the client for payment. And, and you know, again, this requires a headcount, this requires man hours. Um, and it requires like very detailed tracking, depending on how diverse your client base is. So, you know, manufacturers love it, you know, distributors love it, brands love it. And on the dispensary side, um, you know, they definitely do appreciate the alleviation and, you know, bespoke is coming in, you know, we are a secured lender. We are risk takers. We like identifying operators who we believe in and, and helping enable their success, because that's what ultimately will allow our company to succeed and thrive and grow alongside the industry. So there's actually been very, you know, very little negative feedback in terms of like the product um, outside of just, you know, getting the related parties just familiar with how it works and what what the terms are, because it really does change the game of, you know, what that collections process looks like and what that relationship with the vendor looks like. Because again, we're not just solving problems here, but we're also creating the opportunity for growth. So an easy way to think about it is if you're a vendor that has a dispensary customer that has on a monthly basis purchased $50,000 worth of products from you, you know, that is a viable, healthy relationship. If we work with that dispensary, increase their purchasing power, and that dispensary now suddenly turns from a 50K a month client to a 100K or 150K client, there's tremendous value for the brands and the manufacturers. There's a tremendous amount of value for the dispensary to take advantage of economies of scale and you know, source some kind of volume-based discount or a COD payment discount if they've already had terms from their vendor. So for us, it's, you know, there is some some nuance into how to think about using it properly. Um, but like with any of our financing, it serves a dual purpose. On the one hand, it alleviates hurdles and, and bottlenecks from a capital perspective. But on the other hand, it, if, if you're not in a capital crunch and if you are, you know, fine from a cash flow perspective, it still is a tool that you should consider because it can actually increase the profitability of your business um, if used correctly. But that's a good point. Now, do you need to have any kind of parameters or any kind of qualifications to enter the program? Because like you said, do you need a company that is cash flow positive or they need to show something that says, okay, we can lend out the, and just like you would lend, you know, for B on behalf of bespoke, is that the Mm -hmm. same kind of measurements that need to be done a qualification? It's 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 more nuanced and tailored to the dispensary leg. And again, cannabis is a very, it's a hyper local market to a large degree. Right. Um, you know, each state is its own ecosystem and its own market. And so I, you know, I feel like this is this is something where we just leverage our core competency and offer more broadly. Okay. But no, from from a, a dispensary standpoint, I'd say the one limiting factor would be just how long these businesses have been operational and generating revenue. So um, we don't work with, you know, just startup companies. We don't provide, you know, financing to pre-revenue companies unless, you know, it's an expansion of an existing company, in which right. case it's a different picture. But, um, you know, we do need some some evidence of the business running for us to actually do our analysis and determine what the right sizing of our of the credit limit should be. Um, understand really what the core advantage is and what the potential challenges of any given operator are. Because again, especially with the brick and mortar retail footprint, you know, your very, very local demographics matter a lot in terms of what the what what your business opportunity so, could be ultimately. So um, I would say there aren't there aren't any fixed parameters outside of just being operational and, and having transactions that we can review. Now I want to follow side. up on risk and just terms of uh, where things are. As as a component, what buy now pay later does. I want to go into commercial break and ask you about that, and then I also want to ask you about, uh, <clears throat> you know, our last talk was March twenty twenty one. You mm-hmm. know, we did talk about the market. We talked about you know where things are, and obviously now things have changed. Where we have a very volatile bear market with a lot of inflation that has not slowed down yet, as the latest consumer price index has indicated we're going to talk about that and more with the ceo and co-founder of bespoke financial george mantrell here on blunt business website is bespokefinancial.com b-e-s-p-o-k-e b-e-s-p-o-k-e financial.com back after a short break 
rolling into some sponsors, but we'll be right back with more Blunt Business. We are back with George Mantrell, CEO and co-founder of Bespoke Financial here on Blunt Business. So I want to take more from the story that came out with Reuters talking about expanding the buy now, pay later service. This is more from the story. Quote, both firms believe their service can sidestep worries such as the tap into larger fees from companies, especially the niche cannabis industry rather than consumers. And you said this, quote, with B2B, there's a way to actually underwrite risk and to measure risk in a way that's much more difficult than on the consumer level. So talk to me about the differences that take away the difficulties you mentioned. Yeah, I'd say, you know, when when buy now, pay later really started getting traction in the broader market, you know, this is 2019, 2020, um, it was focused on that consumer leg, right? So these these firms were effectively trying to gauge how likely was just this consumer to repay in some timely period that they offered. Uh, that is significantly harder to do. We think just, you know, the diversity of individuals and the amount of factors that go into it. I mean, you've, we've seen the performance of, of you know, the, the buy now, pay later space it's definitely faced its challenges mm-hmm. from a growth perspective and from a, a risk perspective as well. For us, you know, working on the business level and, you know, having, having the ability to sit from a top-down view, it's actually decently cleaner to underwrite a business just because, you know, you can ask for, you know, financial records. And, you know, there is a management team that will make themselves available to provide insight or answer questions about any sort of, you know, anomalous sort of data that you're seeing or transactional activity. Um, And, you know, from a data perspective, we just think there's a lot more uh, data, quite honestly, for us to underwrite versus just an, an unsecured consumer loan. Because again, one of the problems with with the unsecured consumer loan is that you know a, any consumer could use a variety of different buy now pay later services for a variety of products and they may not even know what their total liability is um working at a business level especially one that has the internal infrastructure to record all of this the the data gathering and the collection and the deciphering of what the intent of the capital use is, is just much more clearly defined, more so than it is on the consumer level. And again, on the consumer level, it's, you know, you can use buy now, pay later for your Peloton bike, but guessing you're not going to buy another Peloton bike after you have one Peloton bike. So um, right. on a business level, this is recurring transactional activity that happens. And so it's, it's more consistent behavior that you're evaluating in order to gauge risk. What a difference 18 months makes, George. Our last discussion, we had talked about how investors may be thinking about allocating a portion of their money to cannabis stocks. <laughs> well, things were so much better then. Uh, yes. Anyway, you had spoke about at the time how the cannabis industry is a good way for investors to diversify their portfolios and invest in growth plays as the industry's, uh, industry gets more consumers, creates new ways to deliver products to consumers, and develops new pharmaceutical uses. But now we have the norm of inflation of all tilting the market. I mean, just today, the consumer price index has raised up. After we saw a drop, so now the Fed's looking at possibly raising the interest rates by 75, uh, 0.75 or 1% at the highest end. And, you know, doesn't look like we're, we're completely out of that. We're waiting for crypto to kind of work its way through. So, like, investment and seeing where cannabis is, obviously we know that uh, – Overall, we have information from BDS Analytics, their monthly cannabis sales data. Uh, they mm-hmm. this is from New Cannabis Ventures. I'm getting this from. They mentioned that for 11 states, they it did increase from a 4.6 percent from June to 1.69 uh, billion on the most recent uh, information, and on a per day basis, sales increased 1.2 percent sequentially. Eastern markets uh, range from down as low as negative 13 percent in pennsylvania to up to 27 percent in florida western markets you had 23 percent loss in colorado to a 10 percent gain in california compared to year to year so we know that there's some stability within the market we know that there's growth in certain markets as opposed to others but what do you say to those investors about this relative stability of cannabis now throughout this financial time yeah i mean i think look cannabis because it's all it's been a growing industry and you know once a state turns on 
adult use sales or medicinal sales, you tend to see a very marked spike in terms of activity. I think the industry and investors have been a little too conditioned to expect consistent double digit growths year over year, irrespective of everything. Now, keep in mind, this is the first full on, you know, challenging, sustained macro economic period that, you know, we've had legal markets that have been existing for years, where we get to see a test case of how they perform in this environment. I do think exactly what you said, the resiliency of sales in this environment where the consumer is getting squeezed, where, you know, capital markets are, you know, I, I actually wouldn't describe them so much as, you know, being in, in a full on bear market. I actually think it's more of just a cautious sort of weary eye to the future that and that by itself is enough to slow deployment and, and you know, sort of curve the risk appetite of investors. I do think, though, from from taking a couple steps back, it's really that resilience of sales that points to the core strength of cannabis. And, and you know, that's been a thesis since adult use sales really started in size that cannabis can be one of those industries like alcohol, like tobacco, like pharmaceuticals, where this is a consumer staple. So, you know, as stretched as budgets go, you know, vacations may be on the cutting block from an expense reduction standpoint. And, you know, nice to have discretionary spending will definitely get paired back. But that cannabis had its own unique place where this would be a market that arguably would outperform any other consumer product sector. And I think we're seeing that. Um, what we're also seeing, though, is just the natural growing pains of a maturing market. Um, you know, nothing moves in line lockstep, you know, between demand and supply. Um, I think the state of cannabis today is, is uh, it's, you know, a tale of two cities to some degree. You have the more mature markets that have been established that are mostly just dealing with an oversupply issue. Um, you know, there's 2020, even with the quarantine, even with COVID, because of fiscal stimulus, because of restriction and where consumers could spend their money, cannabis had a fantastic year. You know, demand had never been consistently higher. Um, you know, month over month sales were consistently increasing. It led a decent amount of, you know, mature and smart operators to build future game plans, assuming that that would stay in a steady state in terms of demand and growth. Uh, the problem is, you know, everyone kind of had the same brilliant idea at the same time. And so when you get into the next calendar year, you have a ton of supply that hits the market. And then because of macro factors that dissipated or just disappeared, you had consumer demand repricing, you know, not just stimulus, not just, you know, I'm able to travel again, but also inflation, which is digging into people's budgets uh, left and right. And so um, I, I do think that the more mature markets are just going through a correction that will normalize what that supply and what that actual demand looks like. I think newer markets, um, you know, whether you're looking at the Midwest or you're looking at the East Coast, they definitely have not hit that supply saturation point just yet. Um, but that's more just because they've started later and from whether it's licensing or whether it's setting up businesses, they're just moving a couple steps behind. That being said, I think operators in all of those states should really look to these mature markets and see what happened to inform what their own future could entail. Because at the end of the day, you know, any mature market should be producing a good at a lower and lower cost to the consumer. You should just be getting more efficient, should be operating at a bigger scale, taking advantage of economies of scale. Um, and so, you know, I, I actually look at look at this as, as challenging and as painful as it's been for operators. This is the current and expected future state of the world. It's going to be a more competitive space. It's not going to be as lucrative for as long as everyone intended. And that's because of a lot of issues that have consistently remained even with adult use sales going on. So competition from the black market, um, you know, the cost of running a legal business that adds on to the price of your products to the consumer, and then just macro factors that you can't even really control. So where I sit, you know, I, I look at this and say, as, as challenging as it's been, the reduction in price and, you know, the ability for operators to have a sustainable business in this new pricing regime is going to be the deciding factor. And it's not all bad news. Um, you know, a huge reason why a lot of consumers still stay in the black market is just a cost perspective. You know, it's cheaper to not pay taxes and buy the same product or effectively the same product. In order for the legal market to compete, it has to get more competitive on a price point because ultimately consumers are price sensitive. And so, you know, I think this is, again, it's a painful lesson to learn. 
Um, but you know, growing any industry from zero to one is going to be involved. It's going to involve painful lessons, lessons, and and you know, growing pains. So I, again, I don't think it's nearly as as dire as I think some of the headlines I've read out there are. But it is a, a wake up call for operators where it's like if you're building a business, assuming that prices are going back to where they were a year ago or two years ago, <laughs> you're going to be in for a lot more pain. I agree with you that there is not uh, enough said because obviously inflation is such a, a hot headline. But yeah, there was a need for this correction in various sectors. But I think there was some activity that was done in terms of just continue to print money. Continue mm -hmm. to go ahead and you know have the issues that are going on where uh, things overseas have caused the oil price to go up. But what, but what really grinds my gears is the fact of how it's actually affected everything else when it comes to precious metals cryptocurrency some of the things that you would think would not be attached at all to what's going on here and the same well i bring that up because in the relatability of cannabis you know no matter as you said by the way correction on my end california had a negative 10.1 percent uh drop in growth in their sector year to year according to bds analytics but the thing is with cannabis if there's areas that are seeing growth or not, all those stocks are still falling the same way as the rest of the market. Mm -hmm. And I wish there was a way to kind of separate that out, but I don't understand. Really, when it comes down to it, what is it about the investors? Why can't that be separated away? Why is it that everything has to be lapped in together? Yeah, I mean, I think, look, there's, there's when fundamentally on a macro level, you know, there's a repricing of base interest rates. And, and you know, that's really what the Fed controls. It's like the borrowing cost of, of the U.S. government to some degree and the funding costs of banks um, that operate within the system. There's, it's like a ripple effect that goes through the entire economy. And what it does is first interest rates rise, then, you know, investment grade companies start repricing what their cost of funding is. That's going to be higher. High yield companies reprice higher. Uh, middle market companies, these are getting increasingly risky on, on the risk spectrum. There's more and more of an outsized move typically that you see because there's just been a repricing interest rates for the safest borrowers are no longer at zero. If those rates rise to 2.7% or 3%, then everyone else has to similarly move in line. Otherwise, you'd have a major sort of risk arbitrage situation. I think cannabis, to, to your point, one, I don't think that the publicly listed cannabis stocks that that you know any investor has access to right now are yeah. truly that representative of the cannabis industry. Okay. Um, this is primarily a, a group of maybe twenty or so MSOs that have you know multi-state operations. They have a, a huge sort of operating expense and a burn mm -hmm. that a small to mid-sized business that's focused on one market or a handful of markets can run more efficiently and more leanly. And for us, one thing we've learned is that the vast majority of cannabis operators fall into the small to mid-sized bucket. And even at a mid-sized bucket, you know, that includes companies that are doing 50, $75 million in annual sales. So like, right. it's not exactly like small by any comparison, but um, you know, these are private companies. Again, they bootstrap their business for the most part. Right. They are not affected by, you know, having to release their quarterly earnings, you know, being in the private space, does have value in and of itself, especially if you're a growing company and you don't want to expose yourself right. to the volatility. So I think it's a mix of, you know, one, look, everything's getting repriced. Um, you know, everyone's trying to get a handle on what the future looks like from a consumer demand standpoint and consumer spending. And ultimately, there's like a, a somewhat of a selection bias of, you know, skewing to these companies that just have, you know, I look at most of the MSOs and I see businesses that would really thrive under a certain set of federal legalization parameters. Yeah. Um, absent many of those parameters, you have redundancies, uh -uh. you don't have synergies, and you right. have uh, a huge operating cost that it's very, very hard to compete with if you're not dealing in a sector that's growing year over year consistently. There you go. I love it. It makes a lot of sense. Now, one other thing I want to ask about when it comes to while we're in this uh, change in the market, you know, don't ever underestimate the the creativity and the forth for, forward thinking of the MSOs. Uh, mm -hmm. Cannabis Ventures also reported that as your clients are navigating industry challenges like pricing pressure, you've seen creative ideas emerge. For example, some large scale cultivators are starting to sell their own branded products. 
Talk to me about some of the power plays the MSOs have been making that might be under your portfolio and really the find the ways to continue to keep growing. Yeah, I mean, honestly, we've definitely seen that trend pop up, um, especially as wholesale flower prices have have come in a lot lower. Yeah. Um, I'll be honest, we've mostly seen it with non MSOs. We've seen it with private cultivators, um, you know, single state growers or, you know, limited multiple state growers where they, they just looked at what the economic return of selling on the wholesale market was relative to creating their own brand. Now, creating your own brand has its own host of challenges. You have to build a brand identity. You have to build customer loyalty. You have to find out what exactly your competitive edge is. And I do think a lot, you know, most of these cultivators with good quality flour that you would typically just find in any other brand that you, that you would purchase from a dispensary, they definitely have a lot of advantages in terms of getting into the space, but it is an entirely new game for them um, versus selling on a very liquid sort of wholesale space. So um, I think it, that is exactly the kind of forward thinking, you know, acceptance of reality to some degree, but also <laughs> creative solutions into how to navigate it. That really is the mark of a successful company and a successful team that's focused on a long-term vision here. And we think it's very compelling. I mean, what, what we've seen in California, you know, even with our own active borrowers is like really high quality flower coming to the market for consumers at meaningfully more attractive prices from, from a value perspective. And, you know, even with being more competitive on price point, the business of the cultivator, the economics and the revenue are significantly improved relative to what they, what they were if, when they operated strictly in, in the wholesale space. So again, it's, I think it's a very creative idea. It's not a cure-all by any means for a lot of the challenges that exist. And again, that is its own path to walk down as a business in terms of building building a brand. But it's a very, very good signal of, you know, just dynamic critical reasoning and problem solving that, that you know, you want to see in any entrepreneur. Let's go and come on back and wrap things up here with George Mantrell, CEO and co-founder of Bespoke Financial here on Blunt Business after a short break. Rolling into some sponsors, but we'll be right back with more Blunt Business. Back with final questions and quick wrap up with George Mantrell, CEO and co-founder of Bespoke Financial. And again, if you were looking for the website, it's bespokefinancial.com. And they offer a variety of lines of credit for cannabis clients, including a general line of credit, inventory financing, purchase money financing, invoice financing, and dispensary financing. And you're unlocking value in clients' balance sheets. So real quickly, uh, as we wrap things up, take a minute to go ahead and talk to our audience about what they should be doing and how they should be working with you at Bespoke once they go to the website. Yeah, no, I mean, obviously, you know, one, once again, thanks for, thanks for having me on, but sure. you know, I'd say any, any operator out in this space that again, if you're dealing with working capital limitations, if you're dealing with, you know, restrictive capital um, or conversely, if you see a growth opportunity that makes a lot of sense for you, whether it's branching out into a new geography, whether it's adding a new SKU, um, we're, we're here to talk, you know, I think we take, a very consultative approach in terms of talking with companies, just trying to really understand what management's vision is and, and really what the intended uses of this capital are. And we try to provide, you know, our own input, you know, examples of what we've seen with other operators, but we, we really do invite any operator to come and, you know, start the conversation. Conversely, for anyone who has very much defined what, you know, where we can add value in our services, you know, between our partnership with Blaze, and even between reaching out to our sales team um, for any of our financing products, you know, we invite the call, we invite the conversation, and we really do like, you know, just being creative with our with our products and with our solutions that we offer to the market. And so, you know, the the only way to get to that path is to actually start the conversation. And so, you know, please do reach out. We we'd love to chat with anyone. Fantastic. Once again, I'm joined with George Mantrell, CEO and co-founder of Bespoke Financial here on Blunt Business. George, thanks for coming back on again, getting through all this one more time, and uh, best of luck. We'll always obviously keep the door open, and let's look at another return visit down the line. That'd be great. Thank you. Thank you again. All right. Thank you, folks, for listening in to Blunt Business. Make sure, if you haven't done so, make sure to please like, share, and subscribe if you're watching the video, happen to see it on Cannabis Radio on our YouTube channel, but most importantly, you catch the audio version of the podcast. Look for it on Amazon, Apple, Spotify, Google, wherever you find podcasts, especially with Spotify and Apple. Make sure to go ahead and leave us a five-star review. 
leave a review there and you know say something nice about the show we love to go and hear from you and if you feel like you know anybody that should be on the program any comments or commentary you want to leave back on the program please by all means reach out to me brasco b-r-a-s-c-o at cannabisradio.com if you'd like to be a sponsor of the program more than welcome to go ahead and talk about your service and all that right here on the program so thanks for listening again thank you george and thank you listeners we'll talk to you next time The opinions expressed on this CannabisRadio.com program are those of the guests and hosts and do not necessarily reflect those of the staff and management of CannabisRadio.com. Any rebroadcast, republication, or retransmission of this program without proper consent is prohibited.